Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Richard Van Eck, and I am going to tell you a little bit about how video games may be able to help transform education, and also why we might not like that. We hear a lot about how our today's classrooms are leaving kids behind, they're not reaching them. And a study of a thousand students done in the United States, uh, they were recruited at birth, and these students were followed through grades five and actually observed in the classroom to see what it was that was going on in the dominant teaching strategies. And what they found shocked a lot of people. Less than 2% of the time was spent doing anything with technology whatsoever. And in fact, 92% of the time was spent either sitting in their seats doing independent work in workbooks or listening to the teacher talk. And if you contrast this with today's digital lifestyle and the students in our classrooms, the technology that they use, it's no wonder that some of them are tuning us out. If we need further evidence of this, we need only look at the dropout rate. In the US, it's 12%, over 12% for whites, and 22% for non-whites. And by the way, these are students who had the grades uh, to pass when they dropped out and said they would have stayed in school had they been more challenged. Add to this the problems that we face in the 21st century, which, uh, like global warming, are complex and not going to be tractable to the kinds of educational strategies we're doing in classrooms today. If we're going to solve problems like this, we're going to have to interact with huge data sets. We're going to have to understand complex systems, and we're going to have to do so by interacting with hundreds, if not thousands, of our colleagues around the world. So this is why many people are calling for uh, the need for uh, educational reform. Uh, the problem I have with a lot of the conversation around educational reform is that it's too simplistic or binary, if you will. Uh, we talk about things like raising test scores, and I'm thinking to myself, great, let's raise the test scores that don't already measure what we need uh, from our school system for the 21st century. We talk similarly about reducing class size or lengthening the school year, and those are great ideas, but again, if we spend more time using the same strategies to teach fewer students, I fail to see how that's going to make a real difference. So that begs the question, why aren't we talking about or instituting real educational reform? And the answer, I uh, believe, is that we don't care about learning, at least not enough. If we truly cared about learning, we would invest what it takes to individualize instruction for every student, and we just aren't ready to do that. So where does reform come from when it is successful? I would argue that it comes from two possible sources. One, the world around us changes so drastically that if we don't adapt, we will not survive. Uh, the other way that, it, that uh, change is affected, or true reform can be uh, affected, is through the use of disruptive technologies. And disruptive technologies are ideas or technologies that solve a, a problem that we face, but do so in a way that force us to also change the way we behave. And I would say that disruptive technologies are the most profitable way to uh, affect large-scale change, because they don't require us to come together and agree on what we should be doing. They just take over and, and do it themselves. We have a lot of examples in history of disruptive technologies. Uh, the advent of stone tool use, controlled uses of fire, uh, the move from hunter-gatherer societies to uh, village builders, and of course the written word with papyrus and later books. These are all things that fundamentally change the way that we interact with our world. Well, if we, if we go back in, uh, more recently uh, in our history and we look at the Industrial Revolution, we find a very interesting set of uh, factors. First the world changed radically, in, and it forced us to make changes in what education meant. And by that, we had these uh, factories where we needed to have people working in them, and we didn't have an education system that produced people skilled enough to work there. So the world changed, and we, we said we need to change education. But at the same time, there was a whole host of disruptive technologies that accompanied the Industrial Revolution. And the most important of those for our modern education system was this concept of economy of scale and mass production, because we tried to apply that idea to educating uh, our populace. And it led to what I call the widgetizing of education. So we were going to somehow mass produce learners by putting them all in the same place and teaching them all the same thing at the same time. It's a terrible idea, but one that has persisted uh, since. So now, in the current age, uh, which many call the information age, uh, we face a time where ideas are commodities. Information is a commodity, and ideas transfer around the world instantly, overnight. And the world has changed so radically uh, in terms of how we're supposed to interact with it and what it needs of our, of our citizenry that it's going to force, we hope, some change in education. And at the same time, there's a whole host of disruptive technologies involved, the internet, computers, and yes, video games. So the question becomes, are any of these technologies or this need for change in the real world going to make us really look for true educational reform? 
Here's one example of how games might help us with that. This is a picture of a game uh, which was developed. Uh, David Levine was the gaming executive uh, who worked on this game. And he now owns a company that looks at alternative energy. And they, in particular, look for placement of uh, solar and wind energy sites. And they found that these are very complex problems because there's issues of topography and how the wind moves over it and what happens during the daylight hours versus the night hours, or there are endangered species there, what permits have to be pulled, how far are you from, from transmission lines. Any one of these things that you study individually could disrupt the whole placement of that, of that wind farm, for instance. And so they used the 3D modeling tool from this game to build a simulator for figuring out what the best placements would be. And the, the point I make with this is not so much that this gaming technology itself is important, but it's the thinking behind it. The people who built that, uh, that modeling tool and the person who thought that it could be applied to something else were engaging in systems thinking. And that's what we need to be talking about. So games do uh, what they do through the use of a lot of strategies that we already know about. They, they promote these kinds of uh, cognitive skills. So one of the things they do uh, is what's called situated cognition. And in a nutshell, what this means is if you're going to teach somebody to do something, you should teach them in the environment in which they're going to demonstrate that knowledge. Makes sense, right? We learn by doing. And so the question becomes, do we teach geometry uh, by showing people figures and asking them to memorize formulas for the surface area of a triangle or a rectangle? Or do we place them in a simulated environment in which they have to use those formulas in order to solve a problem, such as figuring out how much paint to use to paint a room? Now, this is actually screenshots from a game that I developed for my dissertation, and research like that and others shows that situated cognition, when you use it for educational purposes, uh, actually promotes learning, people learn faster, they retain it longer, and they transfer those, that knowledge to the real world. Another thing that games do very well is they promote systems thinking. And what do we mean by systems thinking? This is a screenshot from a, a fairly popular game called SimCity. Many of you may have come across it before. And uh, that's not my city. I wish I could build one that, that successful. I'm not very good at it, actually. Uh, but games like SimCity, and in fact all games, force you to understand the system behind the interface. If you're going to be successful in navigating your way through a game, you have to understand how that game thinks. And games like SimCity force you to think of a city not as an individual set of discrete items, as we heard a previous speaker talk about, but as a system. You have to understand how taxes interact with public opinion, interact with politics, interact with public safety, with industry, with tax rates. So you, you learn that by interacting with that system, playing with it, adjusting it, and so forth. And this is the kind of thinking that we want out of our education system, but it's the kind that we don't actually do much of. Another way that games are very effective is they promote collaboration, which is also, also often called a uh, 21st century learning skill. This is a vid oops, let me back up. Well, there's a video there of World of Warcraft. And uh, World of Warcraft has 12 million subscribers as of last year. And in, these, in this game, uh, which is a multiplayer online role-playing game, you have hundreds of people, thousands of people working together. And many people look at those examples and say, this is just a waste of time. People could be more productive. Look at them just uh, uh, engaging in entertainment for their own sake. But sociologists and educators look at it and say, this is actually an example of collective intelligence. This is social negotiation of gills, uh, skills. These are people working together to solve a problem collectively that could not be solved uh, individually. And in fact, those kinds of skill sets are the same ones that people like Jane McGonigal has uh, applied to alternate reality games, where people are literally working to solve the problems of oil shortages in the future and uh, problems that plague the human condition, hunger and poverty and so forth. And I urge you to check out her talk on TED if you haven't seen it. This is another skill that games provide, which is problem solving. And Dave Jonathan argues that the heart of a good instructional problem has two characteristics. One, it has a goal that, is, uh, that requires you to generate new knowledge in order to solve it. You don't know the solution. Problems are complex things that, that require you to think through them. But the other part of it is that there's a value to the learner in solving that problem. And schools get the first part sometimes and never get the second part. We always tell people, trust me, this will be important to you later. Uh, it will make sense. Just do it now. And in fact, my colleague and I have uh, done a study of video games, and we've looked at the kinds of gameplay that you have in the different types of games that are out there. And we've been able to map those to the 11 different problem types that are known for problem-based problem learning and 13 different cognitive skills uh, that are used in critical thinking and problem solving. 
So this brings us to engagement, which is odd because many people assume this is where we should start when we're talking about the role of games in education. And that's because there's a misperception about what, what engagement really is. Engagement is not about fun, it's not about motivation. Engagement is actually cognitive effort. You don't actually even enjoy the activities that you are engaged in. And before I give you some of the theories that go into that, I'll just show you what engagement looks like, at least to my dog. This is uh, Rudy. And he is currently engaged in solving the problem of how to get that stick out of the water back to the uh, shore as quickly as possible so that I will throw it again and maximize the number of times it will repeat this activity. The point, though, is that this is a cognitive effort first and an emotional effort second. So what happens with engagement, what's more important to engagement is actually is problem solving. And if you look at the, uh, the highlighted red square there, this is, the, this is the heart of all problem solving. You go through this cycle of formulating hypothesis, making uh, some test based on it, and if you're successful, you, you are done with the problem, and if not, you go back through that cycle. And actually, this is what games do, is they keep you in the middle of that cycle over and over and over again. Because if they didn't, you'd solve it too quickly. Now, the key to doing this, of course, is making sure that the challenge is optimal for, for the player. Too hard, and they'll quit. Too easy, and they won't want to play. And the way that games do that is through a concept called the zone of proximal development. Without going into a lot of detail, in a nutshell, it means there are some things that are so easy, we don't need any help to do them. Not worth teaching at that level. There are other things which are too difficult, no matter how much help we're given. But there's a third set uh, area of effort, which is kind of the Goldilocks zone, where the, the challenge is just right. And this is where all the best learning occurs, when you keep people operating at the maximum of their capability. And this is what games do. They, they optimize that challenge. They tell you, they allow you to choose how hard the level is when you start the game, and they allow you uh, to not move on until you've mastered uh, the individual skills initially. So when we put it all together, what we see is that engagement is actually a combination of problem solving, optimal challenge, uh, and all of those other kinds of cognitive disequilibrium and things that go along with it, which is why they're so effective at doing what they do. So people say, great, that's good. Games do all these things, so let's bring them into our classrooms. And I say, make sure you understand what you're really asking for. Because if we were to bring these technologies into the classroom, they're disruptive. And that means they're going to expect us to operate the same way that they operate. So when we talk about situated cognition and authentic learning, we have to recognize that we're going to have 30 kids in the classroom. And situated learning or cognition would mean having field trips every day of the week or doing lab experiments every hour of the day. There are practical considerations that make that impossible without fundamental shifts in the way that we teach. When we talk about systems thinking, uh, games may be good at doing this, but think of how we teach systems in schools now. The food web, the hydrologic cycle are reduced to two-dimensional diagrams. And you memorize these things and you take some tests on it and you never understand it. Is it any wonder that we can't solve global warming? That we can't figure out what to do to prevent uh, species from being, uh, becoming extinct? And yet, games may be able to help us do this, but they're going to take a long time. It takes up to 50 hours to play a game and complete it. Where in the curriculum are you going to spend 50 hours right now, especially on a skill set that's not measured by our current tests? And then we get to collaboration and the idea of everybody working together in collective intelligence. That sounds great, but if you're going to solve problems in the 21st century by interacting with hundreds of other people uh, to solve problems, well, in our current model of education, we call that cheating. You're supposed to sit in your seat, do, the own, do your own work, not talk to anybody else, right? And we haven't got networks that are open in our classroom. We close sites off and we close off PDAs. We don't allow people to communicate the way do, they do in the real world. So I'm not sure how we're ever going to adopt, uh, adopt this strategy if we don't make some significant changes. And of course, problem solving, we all think it's a goal, but if you look at what our standardized tests measure, they don't measure problem solving. That's a very small part of what's on those tests and it's fairly simplistic problems. Again, it's going to take a lot of time, and it's not going to produce changes that we can measure on a test. And finally, there's engagement. And to me, this is the big issue. Because people assume if engagement means we have to get kids to like what it is that they're doing in the classroom, that could be challenging enough. We have a captive audience, so we just tell them to do it, and they have to do it, right? But the real issue is that engagement as a combination of problem solving, optimized challenge, and so forth, is really an example of individualized instruction. It's the same thing by another name. And individualized instruction will radically change our schools. 
we currently adapt all of our instructional messages to be as easy as possible. We teach the lowest common denominator. And if we're going to really keep kids optimally challenged, uh, and we're going to individualize that instruction, that means some third graders are going to complete the curriculum in two months, and others are going to take two years, right? Because you're going to work at your own pace. We are not prepared to hold back 30% of our classes based on that kind of an approach, nor are we prepared to fund it, I would argue. So until we make those kinds of decisions about how we're going to really adopt those strategies and what it's going to mean to our, our classrooms, we really need to think twice about how this is going to work. So in closing, I would say we have a confluence of two things, where the world has changed so radically that some argue, myself among them, that if we don't change what we do with our educational system, we're not going to produce people that are prepared to solve the problems we'll face. And number two, we have a host of disruptive technologies never seen before in, our, in human history. They're all coming together at once, and one or the other is going to have to affect meaningful reform. But the problem is, if we do that, we have to recognize that, uh, that disruptive technologies, by their very nature, destroy things. They don't save them. And if we bring in games, we have to bring in all of the attendant strategies that they use, or we aren't going to be able to make any kind of a difference. Revolutions are messy. People get hurt. Not everyone survives a revolution. So if we're willing to make those changes and we're willing to, willing to bring in video games as a potential solution, we have to understand that they won't save the educational system but destroy it. And that may be exactly what we need. Thank you.